Okay. Yeah, no, that's I'll be fine. It doesn't matter if this ends up in the recording. Hello, everybody. Our uh, presenter is Matt Thomas. He's uh, in California at the moment. He couldn't travel today. But, uh, he has a great and very detailed presentation for you about ASD MIPS and a bunch of the changes that he's been making. So I will hand you off to him, and then I'll just step in to help with fielding questions when we get to that point. And off we go. So basically, I've been doing MIPS stuff since 19, uh, 1988, when I first worked on VMAX for that. So yeah, MIPS is kind of in my blood. About six years later, NetBUC imported the DC 44 Lite uh, for, the, for the PMAP, which I actually have never looked at. Finally, the generic MIPS code was at NetBUC when the, when the new MIPS port was added in 98. Since then, there's been a lot of other MIPS ports, but most of them were done between 99 and 2003. And pretty much everything is stagnated, stagnated since then. For those who not, are not familiar with this architecture, I'm just going to give a brief overview. The first MIPS was MIPS 1, which was the R2000, R2000. It was basically 32 bit with delay slot, load delay, load slots, and all the other things. So they had a really simple TLB, but since they were so old, you know, nobody actually thought of having an integrated locking function. And MP on those were the real pain, which we did to death. Later on, the MIT 3 came out, that was 4,000, and it was the first 64-bit MIPS. Later on, that became MIPS 64, and uh, along with that came the MIPS 32, which so was 32-bit locking instructions, and pretty much the same TLB as the MIPS 3. And those are all pretty much the same, but have slight differences. Now, the MIPS architecture, it's split into basically kernel and user address spaces. And one significant thing about the MIPS architecture is sign, which means that kernel addresses are negative and user addresses are positive. In addition, the kernel address space is split three ways. Half of it is used for direct map access, half of it is TLB map, which means you need a TLB entry to translate the virtual now, the direct map that is only maps the first 512 meg, that's split into regions that either map it as cached or uncached. And pretty much all the MIPS systems only address the first 512 meg. I've never actually encountered a MIPS that had addresses outside of 512. Now, the 64 bit address rate that was added to the R4000 is split into four segments user, super buffer, that's what you really need the super buffer. And then you have a kernel direct map, which is can be K60, K6 K6 one but it encompasses all of memory up to 59 bits. And then you have a, another 2 gig. Um, 62 bits worth of uh, kernel TOB map space. So you have <coughs> pretty much all the spatial. Again, as I said, addresses are still signed. And, you know, positive addresses are used very much. Negative addresses are for the kernel. I'm mean, just going to make a supervisor since somebody uses it. As I said, k 6 0 k 6 one still map the first 500 will make a physical memory. Now, interesting, since um, addresses are Sign, they're also signed extended with money. So it turns out that the future of one still exists, except for they are in the top four gig of RAM, such that they're at FFF, 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 blah, 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 blah. So, I mean, they're basically, the kernel space that was added was added below the K6 kernel. As I said, X, X direct maps all physical memory. But the way MIPS does it, you have what, what are called CCAs, or cache coherence attributes. And they say whether you're memory coherent, uncached, you know, local coherent, you have up to eight of them. 
next stage was designed such that it splits into eight segments, one for each day. So every piece of memory is mapped. You know, you can tell you next to be at any PA you want. So that actually limits the total amount of physical memory you can access. Most systems only have 40 or 8 bits or 44 bits of physical address space. Those are the only ones that are wired. So it really isn't an issue. Now, MIPS later originally came out was 32 bit only. And that was called the O32 API. And it's pretty much what's used even today on GPUs. But when um, the R4000 came out with 64 bit architecture, Extended O62 and you know, extended the tags, blah, blah, blah. And they came up with O64, which is pretty much identical to O32, except for it's 64 bit wide. Now, over time, they realized O32 and O64 is that you really cannot pass enough arguments and registers. And since that, since memory access, um, it turns out that really can lead to a significant increase in speed. So they came out with the N64 ABI, which changes the way but um, it allows you to pass eight arguments rather than four. It also cleans up the stack usage. Later on, they realized that, hmm, this works pretty People still need bit ABIs because a lot of uh, because in 64 is kind of wasteful for me. So in they come up with in 64 except for pointers are now back to 32 bit. Longs are 32 bit, but everything else is still long long is still 64 and it's still 32. So basically all I did is change things to be a 32 bit ABI. Now, I got engaged uh, while I was kind of doing that 64 I just never got around to it until uh, somebody paid me to do it. Well, that's just the brakes of life. And basically, they wanted MIP64 on the RMI, the NetLog Broad document. Fish is eaten by bigger fish. The XLR, XLR. These are very big. They're multi-core, they're super scalar, they address memory, they have a lot of I.O., they have a lot of um, they, The ones that I've been using have two, eight, eight cores, four threads per core, up to 32 threads per chip. And then with the XLP, you can actually tie multiple chips together, so you can actually get up to 120 threads. And there are plans for things in this family to go much larger, 320. So that is a very different thing than an R3000 or even a MIPS 32 CPU. And that required a lot of changes. Um, they use a 40 bit physical disk, which have up to one terabyte of RAM, but they don't. Uh, um, and they, unlike the R4000 previous CPUs, they actually support a full 32 map space. Most of the other earlier CPUs only can have one terabyte or 16 terabytes that they have to do. That's enough. So, drop the SLP and you can actually do the full 16 bits. That's actually like you want to maybe rule it now. They also have multiple IX on the XLR or multiple PCIe on the XLR as an SLP. They also have, you know, accelerate, public PC, compression, network. For the newer chips, even a regular expression match. Well, when I started this, it was for an FDC call, which again only used 32 ABI, which pretty much meant that 64 bitness was never going to be used. The kernel was 32 bit only. It only used memory which could be addressed via case, which also limited to 512 bit math. So these CPUs have 
uses a 32-bit API. All user programs are fine. We use N32 because, face it, LS does not need Nor do 99% of the utility in that Maybe once in a while if you're like, compiling a really good part, do that. It might be nice that for bit. But for the most part, you don't really need Now, the other significant change from our O32 port is that the XLS and XLR kind of it. So, image, so I would have to have added a lot of things, like what are the instructions that are used for N32? I would have done a lot more work and a lot more effort. And I just punted it and decided to change things so we would use Apopolis instead. And that's probably out of stuff that we have. Doesn't even care about floating points. Now, the other implication is that if you have a 64 bit kernel and you use one of the 32 bit, getting that twice to look at you know, kernel memory is going to go, ECA instructions don't look right. And that's what changed how this kernel memory on Brock was a net stat or instant. But we are going to be more and more going to do that, and we just actually look at you get the stuff via system control. So it's really not that much an issue. Then the other big event of having user land is that if you have a kernel that's compiled for N32, or if you have a kernel that's compiled for N64, if you had you know, uh, N64 user land, you could never use an N32 uh, user land. So this gives you the you know, to pick what kernel is more appropriate for your environment. Now, the thing that N32 doesn't require is that obviously we have a 32 bit user line. But, you know, NetBC by default is expecting 64 bit user line. But NetBC has this really cool thing called Compat NetBC 32, which allows you to run 32 bit programs in a 64 bit kernel. And it works pretty well. It's cool. It was very complete. And it was a lot of uh, syscall. And so this is called that work limited work completely emulating everything. So one of the things that had to be done was augment the seek to boot the system using a completely user on which was not possible before I actually So I uh, had to add mount to the various mount structures that are used by various files systems. They're all different and all oral. Also, the routing socket was really not 16, 64 bit clean, and that had to be changed to actually become 64 bit clean. And those were the biggest items from getting a completely 64 bit clean. Because not only is the routing socket used for like, the route command, but it's also used when you do a get I pattern in Liz C. So there's a whole bunch of
is that the PCI Pacific exhibits 256 megabytes. So if you map that with 4 megabytes or 4 kilobytes of HTML, a lot of them, and you would eat up most of your library. That since you can actually use a PIN, you avoid all those types of issues. Now, one of the other problems of course, of address space is you find out that a lot of DMA devices are restricted to certain four gigs. You have a 350 DMA on a lot of PCI devices like the HCI or the USB. So, obviously, when you're doing an I.O., you need to make sure that you're within that first four gigs. And if not, you have to up. So what you really want to do is partition your memory between those that are below the four gig limit and those that are above the four gig limit. And I'll get into more of that why that's significant later on. And now we come to the 60 per gig problem. Hips kernels can be built either an entry or an or kernel. Regardless, they want address mode. And the reason why that is is so you can take advantage of x86. So when you do hash plus operations, you're not actually passing the virtual headers to the region. You're actually having a register type, you know, a register two, which is 64 bit long. Which means my capture team is x86. And I don't have to worry about, hmm, do I have to go map this page? Do I not have to map this page? And that simplifies a lot. Now then we also have what we call local 
question. Sure. What's the question, Paul? Hey. I went through this slide and got the SPL. Is that just a legacy name? or? Oh, it isn't. Um, those are basically software priority levels, which are like IPL non, IPL BN, blah, blah, blah. And how does that change? to a hardcore priority level. So, I mean, you can think of a SPL and ICL screen, but they're still referred to as SPL. No problem. So, basically,
has the VA in, you know, it's decoded a, a low port number. So you have one VA that, you know, what's lower application for perhaps. And it actually causes a lot of complexity, low level complexity, when having too much field needs and stuff. So, you no, know, I thought about that for one moment. Well, how hard would it be?
last time on it. This is one reason why you can grab that statement because it's so useful in that it allows me to avoid it. I can just refer to page and not worry about it. Now, the other thing is there are other parts like uh, RMP6 uh, virtually in that specifically that you need this support. So this is not only helps Smith, this will also help ARM. And so what are the other features of that is?
Can you do it that way? I've never asked 